gustaría inicialmente expresar nuestra gratitud por el Estado de Colombia, por el apoyo uh, en este periodo de sesiones. Uh, es saludar muy especialmente la representación de la sociedad civil, como también del Estado. Y esta audiencia tiene por objeto abordar en términos generales la temática de la discriminación en el acceso a la salud y a servicios de atención de salud de buena calidad, teniendo en cuenta sobre todo las altas tasas de suicidio en las comunidades indígenas y además el problema de la esterilización forzada. Ah, tenemos este objeto. La dinámica de trabajo será inicialmente la sociedad civil, con 15 minutos. Después, la representación del Estado por 15 minutos. La Comisión Interamericana. Ah, tenemos Antonia, la comisionada Antonia, que es la encargada para la Relatoria de Pueblos Indígenas, el comisionado Joel. Ah, y tenemos también el relator especial para la libertad de expresión, como también nuestra querida Elizabeth, que es la secretaria adjunta de la comisión. Y tengo el honor también de invitar a nuestro comisionado Francisco Iguiguri, que es el relator especial incluso para Colombia. Y ahí tendremos 15 minutos para um, la comisión y después comentarios de la sociedad civil, 7 minutos del Estado y el CERVE. Uh, es un honor también tener la relatora de la ONU para el tema de la violencia contra las mujeres, Dubravnaka. Es un honor tenerla aquí. Y, por favor, entonces, y perdón por, de, por la deselegancia del control del tiempo, pero el tiempo es muy no limitado. Uh, entonces, el tiempo ahora a Sociedad Civil por 15 minutos. Por favor. Saludando una vez más. Good morning. I will begin. Good morning to the chairperson and to the commissioners. I want to talk about, uh, I'm here to talk about suicide uh, among Indigenous peoples and communities in Canada. My name is Del Graff. I'm the child and youth advocate for the province of Alberta. I am also a Métis citizen, one of the three identified Indigenous peoples of Canada. With me is my colleague, Corey Osoup, the Saskatchewan Advocate for Children and Youth. We are members of the Canadian Council of Child and Youth Advocates. We bring greeting on behalf of our council. The Canadian Council of Child and Youth Advocates is an association of children's advocates from across Canada who have mandates to advance the rights of children and youth and to promote their voice. We are all independent offices of the legislature in our respective jurisdictions. Before I begin the presentation, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the, is the traditional territory of the Muisco peoples. I hope I pronounce that accurately. Today, I want to address three areas of critical importance to Canada. The need for a national data system on suicide, a national suicide prevention strategy that supports regional applications led by Indigenous people, and the programs and services to directly serve those who most urgently need them. National data for Indigenous people regarding suicide is not adequate. Statistics from 11 years ago show that in areas heavily populated by First Nations people, suicide rates were 10 times higher for male young people and 17 times higher for young females compared to areas where few, there were fewer First Nations people. Prior to this, to this 2007 data, available national statistics for Indigenous youth suicide were close to 25 years old. Here lies the problem. Useful and reliable data is limited by the quality and coverage of data, the lack of culturally relevant health indicators, and jurisdictional barriers associated with Indigenous status and geography. Despite these challenges, what is clear is that Indigenous children and youth experience significant health and social disparities, with more injury, suicide and disease, and less housing, education, food security, and clean water than their non-Indigenous peers. Canada needs to create a national database on suicide so we know what is taking place, both in terms of risk factors and protective factors and how to address them. 
A strong national suicide prevention strategy is supported by a strong national data collection system. At the provincial and federal levels, work has been done to address the issue of suicide, but efforts are not coordinated. I appreciate the complexities of creating a national strategy, but I also know it can save lives. In 21 OECD countries that implemented strategies, suicide rates dropped, primarily among youth and the elderly, the two populations most at risk in, our, in Canada. Both the United Nations and the World Health Organization have called on all nations to implement national strategies. Canada is the only G8 country without one. It is time to demand that Canada takes this critical step. Services and supports must acknowledge the unique experience and interests of Indigenous peoples. The impact of colonization, residential schools, and the current child welfare system in Canada has been devastating for Indigenous people. If this is ever to change, all levels of government must take action to support Indigenous people in ways that work for them, not against them. In our report, Voices for Change, we identified four areas that will require significant shift to address Indigenous child welfare. Governance and jurisdiction, resources and access, and I note that new resources were announced in the federal budget just yesterday. Programs and service delivery and accountability and outcomes. We believe that these critical areas must be acted upon to improve the experiences and outcomes for Indigenous children and families, both in child welfare and in suicide prevention. Suicide is complex, but it is also preventable. The complexity is compounded for Indigenous young people because of challenges like intergenerational trauma, poverty, poor housing and education. At the same time, Indigenous people of Canada have tremendous strength and wisdom with cultural and traditional ways that define who they are that builds identity and resilience for their members. We know what factors contribute to higher rates of suicide and we know what can be done to address them. We've talked to many Indigenous young people, elders, families and leaders and they all say the same things. These issues are critically important to them and they want to be fully involved in addressing them. Canadians are talking more about these issues. Canada is using the right words, but as we have seen for many years, Talk without action does not improve the outcomes for Indigenous children and families. There must be action and there must also be accountability. I would call on this Commission to request Canada and Indigenous stakeholders appear before you in one year to see what progress has been made. Thank you. I'll now ask Corey to address the Commission. Thank you, Dale. My name is Corey Osoup. I'm the advocate for children and youth in the province of Saskatchewan. I'm a proud uh, Indigenous First Nation man from the key First Nation. It's a pretty small, seemingly insignificant First Nation in Saskatchewan, but one of the things that we're most proud of is that my godmother, my Cookham, was the very first female chief ever elected in all of Canada back in the 1950s. And uh, it's pretty, pretty small, but we're very proud of that, and I'm very proud of her. Um, but make no mistake that today, Canadian Indigenous youth are in a suicide crisis, we're in a mental health crisis, and we're in a human rights crisis. I represent a population of Indigenous youth that in our community of Saskatchewan, the rates of our Indigenous girls in Saskatchewan are six times higher than non-Indigenous girls when it comes to dying by suicide. 26 times, sorry, our Indigenous boys are six times higher, to, more likely to die by suicide than non-Indigenous boys in Saskatchewan. Those are rates that are not dissimilar from across Canada. You know, like Dell said, we don't have the exact data, but some of our best, our best estimates are that uh, suicide amongst Indigenous communities is approximately double that of the Canadian pe population. The rate for Inuit, Inuit people in Canada is six to 11 times higher than the rest of Canada. Indigenous youth living on Canadian reserves are five to six times more likely to die by suicide than non-Indigenous youth in our country. Now I believe that uh, as Advocate for Children and Youth we have a role to play in this moving forward and one of those things that we, that we use as a tool is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of a Child. And one of the most important pieces that we bring to the table when we're talking about Indigenous youth suicide and about our children and youth is ensuring that they have a voice at the table when decisions are being made about them. 
So Article 12 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Child says that state parties shall assure to the child who is capable of forming his or her own views the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child. We believe as adults that we can create solutions and that we do attempt to create solutions for Indigenous children and youth, but many times they do that without their voice. So I would call upon our governments in, in Canada to include children and youth as they are making those decisions and as they are creating this national strategy that Dell has spoken about before me. It's, it's not an easy thing to do, to go and to talk to youth and to include them in their voice and to make sure that their voice is heard, but it's also not easy to ensure that when their voice is heard that their voices don't sit on, sit on a shelf collecting dust. And that's one of the most important things that we can do. We did that in Saskatchewan. We were able to talk to over a thousand youth in Saskatchewan. And they told us what it was like to be a youth in Saskatchewan. We asked them, why do you attempt suicide? Why do your friends and family members, your young friends and family members, die by suicide? They gave us reasons, but more importantly, they gave us solutions. And they gave us calls to action. Not calls to action just to Saskatchewan, but calls to action to the federal government. But even more importantly, calls to action to their families, to their friends, to their local communities, and to their parents. I think that's one of the most important things that we can do. Now, as we call for a national, national strategy on suicide, I believe that it is important that we become a part of that as the Canadian Council for Children and Youth Advocates. So we're embarking in the very early stages of creating a national report on youth suicides from our organization, from the viewpoint of children and youth. And we will be making recommendations from that report to the Government of Canada, and that will be one of the accountability measures that we will, bring for we will be bringing forward to the Commission in the future if we're invited back. So we would like to hold Canada to account as we go through that report and as we um, conclude with those recommendations. And uh, I'd like to honour the TRC and uh, say that we will be making more calls to action rather than recommendations because we know that recommendations, many, many recommendations have been made in the history and on the topic of youth suicide in our country but also across the world. And I believe that uh, the TRC made it perfectly clear that the time, the time for action is now and our children and youth are literally dying as we wait. So with that, I'd like to conclude and I'd like to give the mic over to my esteemed colleague, Cindy Blackstock. Good morning, commissioners. A special greeting, special uh, rapporteur, and uh, an honoring of the indigenous peoples here. I'll get straight to it. Canada racially discriminates against 165,000 children. It has done it since Confederation, and it's got away with it in large part. People don't understand that the federal government funds services for First Nations children on reserve and in the Yukon Territory. All services, everything from early childhood commissioners right through to youth suicide prevention programs, child welfare, and basics like water and housing. The provinces and territories fund those same services for all other Canadians at far higher levels. These inequalities have been known to the Canadian government for at least 111 years. When Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce chronicled the shortfalls in Indigenous children's health and linked it to the unnecessary and preventable deaths of literally thousands of children in residential schools. Sadly, Canada's uh, Confederate year, uh, 150th birthday, was celebrated last year and we are still facing these inequalities. They are compound inequalities. And Canada's approach historically has been to deal with them one program at a time and to, to, with the greatest respect to Canada, deal with them one teaspoon at a time. That means they would never fully allocated what is needed to fully redress the inequalities even in that one area. As you know, commissioners, I appeared before you in December of 2016 regarding the First Nations child welfare case that was brought against the Canadian government and was heard by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. At issue was that Canada's failure to fund First Nations child welfare services at equitable levels was 
driving First Nations children away from their families and into foster care at record levels that have never been seen in Canadian history before, meaning that they exceed those levels of the residential schools. Our argument was that Canada's failure to provide family support services so that children and young people could recover from the harms of residential schools was meaning that child removal became the only option available and not the last option available as it is for other Canadians. In January of 2016, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, after 72 days of hearing, found Canada to be racially discriminating against the 165,000 children by providing these inequitable services and by failing to provide equitable access to all other government services in something called Jordan's Principle. We have had, uh, when I appeared before you, Canada had two non-compliance orders issued before it by the uh, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. So that between uh, January of 2016 and my last appearance, there was two non-compliance orders. There has been two uh, further non-compliance orders issued against the Canadian government, the last one coming on February 1st of this year. So that makes a total of five legal orders against Canada in its own domestic courts to stop this racial discrimination. Yesterday, we got a budget announcement. Canada has said that it was going to comply with the tribunal's orders. But we need to say that its failure to comply with these tribunal's orders has been linked by the tribunal to the deaths of two children by suicide who are denied mental health treatment they should have had, and that hundreds of children have been wrongfully removed from their families because those families have been denied services. That is an inequality in child welfare. It's taken us five court orders to make progress. And although I'm grateful for that progress, we cannot forget that these children are getting less in education, less in early childhood, less in basics like water. And so what the Caring Society has proposed is something called the Spirit Bear Plan. And I've uh, done a detailed written submission to you commissioners and the Spirit Bear Plan is in there. But what we're asking is that Canada actually costs out all of the inequalities in First Nations children's services and works with First Nations to develop a comprehensive plan to end these racial inequalities in a time frame sensitive to children's development. We cannot be sitting here in another 150 years and hearing stories of how Canada is working on addressing these inequalities. There is no excuse for a country as wealthy as Canada and as embedded in human rights to be perpetuating this type of racial discrimination against a whole generation of children. So um, I would strongly uh, encourage the Commission to not only look at the Spirit Fair Plan as one mechanism to be able to do it, but in the alternative, if Canada does not adopt the Spirit Bear Plan, then it needs to present a comprehensive plan to this commission on how it's going to eliminate all forms of racial discrimination against First Nations children, young people, and their families. Because I need not tell you that if you're one of those kids who Canada doesn't think is worth the money, you're going to be experiencing a lot of hardships, not only in your childhood and your adolescence, but throughout your life course. And surely, at this point in time in history, we should be at a place where First Nations kids never have to recover from their childhoods again. Mm -hmm. And non-Indigenous children should never have to say their story. That's what reconciliation looks like on the ground. And that's what we're calling on Canada to do. And we would ask the Commission uh, to hold a hearing within one year period of time. I also have some more detailed recommendations in the written submission. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you for your valuable contribution, important information. It seems to me there is a participation from India, from civil society, right? So we, we will give you extra time, and of course we will give the same time to the state as well. Please. Dear Mr. Abraro and members of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, as the chair of the Canadian Pediatric Society's First Nations Inuit Métis Health Committee, I thank you for this opportunity to share this statement at the hearing convened to address issues related to human rights of Indigenous peoples of Canada. I would like to inform you that in regards to the situation of Indigenous children who are being denied parental accompaniment during emergency medical evacuation by plane, there is some progress forward. After mounting pressure, the Quebec Minister of Health has now agreed that allowing a parent to accompany a sick child during emergency medical evacuation by plane should be supported. 
However, it is unclear when and how this will happen and whether or not it will be enforced. It seems that two out of the three aircrafts are already equipped with an extra seat for a passenger, but that one aircraft will need to be adjusted to accommodate a passenger. It appears that approval by the federal government is required before commencing this work. The timeline for these changes is unclear. In one recent statement, the Minister of Health has estimated one month for this change to take effect. We have neared that deadline and no parent has accompanied their sick child to date. I believe this situation needs to be monitored very closely to ensure that a new policy is enacted and enforced. It warrants cautious optimism since our government has a dark history of broken promises to Indigenous communities. I'm concerned that this promise may very well follow this pattern. On a similar note, many Inuit children from Nunavut who have complex medical conditions are forced into foster care in urban centres such as Ottawa due to lack of necessary medical and social support to keep such a child safe in their home community. Despite parents' best efforts, they are often unable to continue caring for them temporarily in Ottawa as Nunavut residents do not have access to the same type of support services in Ontario, such as nursing services and respite services. These types of services are essential to being able to care for a medically complex child and to avoid caregiver burnout. Parents are unable to relocate their families to an urban centre as they may need to attend to other family responsibilities, such as attending to employment and caring for other children and family members. Following placement into care, parents are only granted two subsidized travel trips per year to visit their child in the urban centre. I believe this is cruel and violates their right to care for their child and maintain proper attachment. I call on the new Nunavut government to change this policy. While we explore ways to provide more care closer to home, a policy to keep families together needs to be enacted and enforced. This includes increasing supportive services for families of children who are medically complex in urban centres and increasing the numbers of travel trips per year for caregivers. Finally, the Canadian Pediatric Society surveyed all provinces and territories about their definition of and practices around Jordan's principle. This survey indicates significant discrepancies in the interpretation and implementation of this principle. Along with other members of the Jordan's Principle Working Group, the Canadian Pediatric Society requests a governmental response that is consistent with the vision of Jordan's Principle that has been endorsed by the House of Commons. It is our concern that Canada's official position is that Jordan's Principle does not apply to Inuit or Métis children and only to First Nations children. It is unacceptable that Health Canada, First Nations Inuit Health Branch provides this differential treatment and discriminates against an entire nation that its organization is responsible to provide services to. We call on the federal government to cease applying its narrow definition of, Dor of Jordan's principle and to take measures to immediately implement the full meaning and scope of this principle in order to ensure timely and equal access to all Indigenous children of Canada. Please consider these calls to action and assist us in advocating for changes that will ensure that the human rights of, an, of Indigenous children of Canada are being respected. Thank you. Thank you once again, our gratitude. And now I'm, I will give the floor to the Honourable Representative of the State of Canada, exactly the same time. So it's 50 minutes plus five extra minutes. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, commissioners and members of the civil society and organizations from Canada and observers. My name is Keith Kahn. I'm the acting assistant deputy minister of the First Nations Inuit Health Branch of Indigenous Services Canada. I was born and raised in the community of Moose Factory for the Moose Cree Nation. Um, just a little bit of personal background. I want to thank the commissioners for providing the opportunity to discuss this truly important issue for the work uh, the, commissioner, the commission does to protect human rights throughout the hemisphere. I'll provide 
a few comments on the Government of Canada's commitment regarding the following related matters. Renewing its relationship with Indigenous peoples, addressing service gaps for children and youth throughout, through Jordan's principle, and reforming Indigenous child and family services. I'm pleased to share an update with the Commission on recent steps that the Government of Canada has taken and its commitment to renewing the relationship with Indigenous peoples based on recognition, rights, respect, cooperation, partnership. In July 2017, the Government of Canada re released a set of principles respecting the Government of Canada's relationship with Indigenous peoples. These principles are the necessary starting point for Canada to engage in partnership with Indigenous peoples and are a step to building meaning into a renewed relationship. In August 2017, the Government of Canada announced the dissolution of, the, uh, the dissolution of Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada as a way to shed the administrative structures and legislation that were conceived in another time for a different kind of relationship, the colonial past of this government. At the same time, Canada announced the creation of the Department of Crown and Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs and the, the Department of Indigenous Services, which the Prime Minister views as an important step in building a true nation-to-nation -nation Inuit Crown government-to-government -government relationship with First Nations Inuit and Métis in Canada. In December 2017, these new departments were created. In February 2018, the Government of Canada announced it, announced it will develop a recognition and implementation of rights framework in partnership with First Nations Inuit Métis peoples. This will include a review of its laws, policies, and operational practices to ensure the constitutional commitments made to Indigenous peoples are respected. Regarding this session's specific thematic topic, the Government of Canada recognizes that First Nations children do not have the same access to health services and quality health care as non-Indigenous children, and that Indigenous children are overrepresented in the child welfare system in the country. This well-being, the well-being of First Nations children and families is a priority for the Government of Canada. As you're aware and was alluded to, the Assembly of First Nations and the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada filed a human rights complaint against the federal government with respect to child welfare services on reserve. In 2016, this complaint uh, by the Caring Society and the AFN was created, substantiated by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, the CHRT. The CHRT issued orders at, the time, at that time and has, has continued to issue orders as necessary so, as was alluded to earlier in the presentation, these orders are upheld, they are being implemented, and at the same time, the Government of Canada must ensure that there are no gaps in, the government, in, in government services. Jordan's principle can address, but is not limited to, gaps in services such as mental health, special education, dental, physical therapy, speech therapy, and medical equipment, and physiotherapy. A dispute among government departments or between governments is not a necessary requirement for the application of Jordan's principle. The most uh, recent order was issued by the CHRT in February 1, 2018 and includes orders in the following general areas. Analyzing agency needs with respect to children and developing an alternative system of funding. Funding agencies' actual costs in prevention and least disruptive, least disruptive measures, building repairs, legal fees, intake and investigation, child, service per, uh, child services purchases, as well as actual costs for small agencies retroactive to January 26, 2016. And also stopping unnecessary reallocation of funds from social programs and reimbursing costs for mental health services for children and youth and ban representative services in Ontario, in the province of Ontario. The Government of Canada welcomes these important decisions on the welfare of First Nations children in Canada. Canada has expanded the application of Jordan's principle to apply to all jurisdictional disputes, including those between federal government departments. Jordan's principle is also no longer limited only to those First Nations children living on reserve who have multiple needs requiring multiple service providers.
Canada respects the decisions of the CHRT and has taken steps to address the past orders. Canada is working closely with the parties to, to the complaint, the Assembly First Nations, the Caring Society, Chiso Ontario, Anishinaabe Aski Nation, the CHRT and the Amnesty International to fully implement most, the most recent orders. To implement Jordan's principle, the Child Initiative, the Child First Initiative was established in July, in July 2016 and provides interim funding, interim funding of up to 382 million to enable an enhanced service coordination model to proactively assist in identifying and addressing needs, a service access resolution fund to address an an any, and a, an ident any identified unmet needs, and of course, data collection, analysis, and reporting activities to enhance information and accountability in terms of implementation of Jordan's principle and longer term policy and program reforms that are necessary to support children and capacity building to ensure that the adequate human resources to, uh, to implement components of the interim approach. Outreach is critical, is, an, is a critical aspect of Jordan's principle and allows the Government of Canada to raise awareness amongst health and social service partners to leverage best practices to better serve First Nations children. For the longer term, we are working to better structure and better structure and funding to create a better structure and funding model for health, social and education services for First Nations children. To do this, we are working with First Nations partners and communities, as well as the provinces and territories to better understand what service gaps exist so we can address them in ways that are tailored to the specific needs of First Nations children, regardless of residency in Canada. In terms of some of the initial investments, the vast majority of requests received under Jordan's principle have been approved, uh, totaling some 33,000 requests for services and supports. These include mental health supports, medical equipment, speech therapy, to name a few. The Government of Canada continues to engage First Nations and provincial territorial partners to collaborate in a longer term solution. It's not satisfactory to say it's an interim measure. There's a, there, there required, there's a requirement for a longer term vision and supports for children across the country. As the Minister of Indigenous Services Canada, the Honourable Jane Philpott announced in December 2017 on the 10th uh, anniversary of Jordan's Principle, she says, we made progress in helping First Nations children access services they need, but much more still needs to be done. We will not rest until every First Nations child in Canada can access services they need without delays and has true equality for all other and has true equality with all other Canadian children. There is no simple solution. We must continue to collaborate with partners and remain focused on keeping the best interests of First Nation children as a top priority. In terms of the issue of suicide, Indigenous peoples of Canada are, are at a much greater risk of experiencing complex mental health and substance use issues due to a variety of factors, including the intergenerational effects of residential schools, the 60s scoop, and other devastating consequence, consequences of colonization. In some communities, particularly in the north, in northern remote communities, rates of suicide rates have reached epidemic proportions. It's unacceptable that children and youth in Canada are growing up with normalized experience and grief and loss from suicide. A substantive equ equity approach to mental wellness supports for Indigenous children and youth must consider the unfair burden of trauma, grief, lost experience by these children and youth as a result of inter intergenerational trauma and persistent societal inequalities and, inequ and inequities. Preventing Indigenous youth suicide is much more than ensuring equitable access to mental health services. It requires a transformational approach to health that acknowledges and addresses intergenerational trauma and social inequities, and which affirms inherent and treaty rights. Recognizing that there's much more to be done, we have begun taking steps to support and address essential mental wellness supports at the community level. A specific example of how we are working with partners to support community-led healing and improve access to mental wellness supports is the Choose Life Initiative under Jordan's principle. 
In response to growing rates of suicide amongst First Nations children and youth, the Choose Life pilot project was agreed to with the Anishinaabe Aski Nation. Choose Life is a two-year pilot project under the Jordan's Principle Child First Initiative that began April 11, 2017 with 49 First Nations Indigenous communities in northern Ontario within the Anishinaabe Aski Nation territory. The, the aim is to provide immediate funding relief to any First Nations in Ontario with youth at risk of suicide by fast-tracking proposals for group child and youth mental health prevention programs and services regardless of the timing of the submission. A lot of these submissions and projects and initiatives are, are working with parents, elders, and have a strong focus on land-based healing practices. I must reiterate that the government is not best place to decide how to support community healing or how to address the root cause of suicide. Rather, our role must be to support Indigenous communities with flexible funding that can be used to meet the unique needs and priorities of each community. There will be no one-size-fits-all answer. Continued engagement with Indigenous leadership and community members and support for community self-determination is, is a much is as much a part of suicide prevention as the above mentioned investments. The Minister of Indigenous Services, Jane Philpott, in her previous role as Minister of Health, stated, we must acknowledge the tremendous amount of preventable suffering, trauma, and loss of life in the past. But the future is before us with the obligation to do better, to do right. The path for health and wellness for Indigenous peoples requires reconciliation, justice, and equity. Before I close, I would like to acknowledge the work of the First Nations Caring Society, <laughs> very much, on its work to bring about meaningful change, and its continued work to bring about the Spirit Bear Plan, which I personally honour and respect. And, um, I would like to acknowledge the work. And I think it's going to be an important journey for Canada to, to actually take hold of the calls for action under the um, Spirit Bear Plan. You have my full endorsement, Ms. Luxlock. We look forward to responding to your questions and hearing the Commission's views, and thank you for the time. We'd like to express our gratitude to the important information provided by the Honourable Representative of the State of Canada, as well as all the effort in developing, improving, and providing proper policies and programs uh, in relation to the respect of Indigenous peoples' rights. Now, um, we have 15 minutes to the Commission, and I will give the floor to our Commissioner Antonia, who is our um, reporter for Indigenous people's rights. So you have the floor, please. Um, thank you, Flavia. Sorry, I'm, I know English, but I feel more comfortable in Spanish, so I will talk in, in Spanish, OK? Thank you. Um, yo quiero hacer algunos comentarios primero y luego algunas preguntas. Lo primero es, eh, recordar, bueno, me imagino que los peticionarios y el Estado saben, pero quiero recordar eh, que tanto la Declaración Americana sobre Derechos de los Pueblos Indígenas, la propia Convención sobre Derechos de los Niños, establecen algunas normas en relación a los niños y niñas indígenas, normas específicas. Eh, de partida, cierto, reconocen el derecho a la identidad que tiene el niño o la niña en general, y esto es fundamental cuando estamos hablando, cierto, de niños y niñas indígenas. Se establece, cierto, que en caso de que el interés superior así lo determine, el niño o la niña deben ser separados de su medio familiar, ellos deben, se debe colocar especial atención a su origen étnico, religioso, cultural y lingüístico. Y además, y esta norma me parece muy importante, que está establecida en la Declaración de Pueblos Indígenas, la Declaración Interamericana, es el derecho a la determinación del interés superior del niño, debe tener siempre en consideración sus derechos culturales. Eh, me parece que este contexto es muy importante porque por lo que hemos escuchado en esta audiencia, eh, cuando estamos hablando del interés superior del niño en, en el materia de niños y niñas indígenas, 
eh, el derecho a la identidad, el derecho a su pertenencia a un territorio, eh, el derecho a su idioma, el derecho ¿cierto? A, a sus prácticas culturales, es fundamental y por lo tanto la conceptualización del interés superior del niño en este caso tiene diferencias respecto de lo que sucede respecto a los niños y niñas que no son indígenas. Eh, precisamente ayer en esta misma sala eh, la comisión hizo el lanzamiento de su informe sobre los sistemas nacionales de protección de los niños y niñas en las Américas eh, y estuvimos conversando sobre los sistemas nacionales de protección desde una perspectiva intercultural eh, y en ese sentido, cierto, la necesidad de que el interés superior del niño sea mirado desde, desde esta perspectiva porque estamos hablando de un derecho que no solo es individual, sino también un derecho colectivo. Entonces, mi primer comentario tiene que ver que ese es el contexto en que estamos y me alegra mucho poder tener este debate porque creo que la situación de los niños y niñas de pueblos indígenas en Canadá pone de relieve precisamente esto que estamos hablando. Eh, de, la, de la exposición que ha hecho la sociedad civil, eh, me, 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 me parece y puedo estar equivocada que las condiciones son similares a un informe que ya hizo la Comisión sobre las mujeres indígenas desaparecidas y asesinadas en la Columbia Británica en Canadá, donde precisamente el efecto de la, de la internación de los niños y niñas indígenas está descrito, el efecto nocivo, la separación de su comunidad eh, y me da la sensación, y ahí voy a las preguntas, que la situación desde este informe no ha cambiado mayormente. Eh, y yo quería pre preguntarle, sobre todo a la sociedad civil, si eh, los Jordan Principles, el Jordan Principle al que ustedes han aludido, eh, parece ser un, un llamado a la acción que a ustedes los satisface, si va en el camino correcto para hacerse cargo de esta, de esta situación que ustedes mismos han dicho que, han, que va de hace más de 100 años y que más allá de las buenas intenciones, la sensación es que eh, el Estado de Canadá no se ha hecho a cargo con la determinación que requiere la urgencia y que requiere la situación. Quisiera saber si a partir de, esta, de este principio eh, que es reciente, ustedes sienten que finalmente pueden ir hacia un camino correcto y lo otro, si es que tienen tiempo, eh, puedo, puedo pensar cuál es la respuesta, pero me gustaría conocerla, que usted eh, señaló cierto esta, lo, el trabajo que hicieron de escuchar a los niños y niñas indígenas y, y, y preguntarles cuáles eran las causas del aumento de la tasa de suicidio. Y en este sentido me gustaría conocer qué dijeron en, est, en, esto, en estas reuniones, qué opinaron ellos sobre este tema. Me gustaría conocerlo si es que hay tiempo. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, our commissioner. Now I will give the floor. I will ask my colleagues, Commissioner Francisco, Commissioner Joel, if they would like to raise some questions, as well as our special rapporteur for freedom of expression. If there is any comment or please. Gracias, comisionada. Eh, muy buenos días a los representantes de la sociedad civil y del Estado. Una pregunta muy, muy breve y tiene que ver, ustedes mencionaron la falta de indicadores sobre la situación de, de los pueblos indígenas y la falta de acceso a la información o de producción de información, en particular de los temas de, de salud. Y quería preguntarles qué tipo de indicadores la sociedad civil está reclamando que se construyan y cuáles son las recomendaciones concretas que tienen eh, para hacer al respecto. Thank you so much. And now the floor is given to Elizabeth, please. Good morning. It's a question of follow-up. The commission had a hearing in early December of 2017 about sex-based discrimination against indigenous women, Indian women, with the particular focus on the difference in treatment between married Um, with Indian women and Indian men who marry non-Indian persons. What we understand is that in later December, the Bill S-3 was adopted and it made certain adjustments, but we've also received information um, where it's not clear when that bill would enter into force and where we understand that the bill may have left certain distinctions in treatment <clears throat> 
in place. And so this is related to the topic in the sense that it affects the transmission of Indian status from parents to children. It affects, in particular, girls, women and girls. And I'm just wondering if there is any further information that you could share with us about this and whether, in your perspective, this has an impact on the situation that you've presented this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I myself, as a reporter for Canada, I'd like to raise three questions, please. The first is about the precise diagnosis towards the uh, suicide, which affects indigenous peoples. If the state of Canada is developing any kind of program, policy, action towards to get this national database collecting um, and considering the gender approach as well as well the the gender and age approach. Uh, my second question has to do with um, the violation of women, indigenous women. Uh, yesterday we had a session. We started our day uh, with the first hearing, public hearing on sexual and reproductive rights. And we had a denounce of indigenous women who are subject to forced sterilization without any consent, informed, nor proper consent. And um, so I'd like to ask uh, the honorable representative of the state if there is a um, data about that, if there is preventive measures which are taken towards this uh, violation. And finally, my third point has to do with the democratic component uh, in public policies about indigenous people's rights and the level of participation of indigenous peoples um, in the creation of policies which affect their destiny. So now I will give the floor to the representatives of civil society for six minutes and then we'll have six minutes to the representative of the states. Please, you have the floor. Jordan's principle is a principle inspired by the death of a child who was left to languish in hospital because Canada and Manitoba were arguing over who should pay because he's a First Nations child. Really the principle, properly applied, is that First Nations children should have access to all public services when they need them without delay or without any adverse differentiation related to their First Nations uh, status. In our view, it is also should be properly applied to Inuit and to Métis children, but Canada has not done that. The opportunity of Jordan's principles improve access and to ensure that the services are culturally appropriate and based so that the child actually gets the services in a way that's relevant to them and their experience. One of the key pieces where we've had concerns about Canada's current implementation of Jordan's principle, although we acknowledge changes, is that they're only applying it to registered Indian children, not to children who self-identify as First Nations. They are not applying it to Inuit children, and there are far fewer cases in British Columbia, the Yukon, and Alberta where large populations of First Nations live, and we don't understand why there's such low reports there. The tribunal continues to have jurisdiction, I think if Jordan's principle, the tribunal, and the Spirit Bear plan were implemented, we see significant changes for, ch for kids. We are concerned that Canada continues to litigate against a family where a girl is trying to get orthodontic services so that it would alleviate chronic pain and uh, so that she could eat and talk properly. Canada does not want to change its policies so that pain and suffering and best interests of children are specifically noted in the criteria for the provision of orthodontic services, and that causes us some concern. With regard briefly to the data collection systems, we have very few data collection systems on Indigenous children nationally. There is no national child welfare data collection system in Canada. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission has advocated that such a system should be developed. It is in all uh, many other Western countries, like the United States, and we would like to have culturally-based indicators on identity, on sense of belonging, on access to, to cultural uh, to language, added as part of the indicators that Canada collects data on. Thank you. <laughs> 
I would like to add some information about the indicators and the need for a national data collection system. <clears throat> Canada is a large country with, with significant regional differences. One of the differences that is, that is critical to us is, is the difference in how we collect information, particularly about Indigenous peoples. For example, we don't have a sound understanding of what, of what constitutes Métis people in our country. There are regional differences depending on which province you belong to. Uh, we don't have a sound uh, understanding of what constitutes a youth. There are regional differences depending on which province uh, you're speaking of. In the child welfare system, we don't have collected information that describes the different forms of maltreatment uh, that, that children experience or the interventions that are, that are in place to support them. We need all of that information to be put forward on a national basis. The critical question for me is, how will you know if the situation for Indigenous people is getting better if you refuse to look? Thank you. I'd like to answer a couple of questions. Um, the first one is around what the kids have to say about, um, about why and some solutions to why, this, why they commit suicide or die by suicide. First thing they said is the impact of bullying and cyberbullying. We know about that. Um, but a couple of interesting things they've said is that it's not just kids bullying kids anymore. It's adults in their community bullying kids. It's professionals in their, in their communities bullying them, such as teachers and members of the police force and other people within their communities. So something that we haven't necessarily heard before or addressed before. Um, lack of emotional support within their communities. Sometimes they only have one significant person in their life, and if that person dies or goes away, um, then they feel like they have nothing to live for. They even mentioned pets uh, as a form of emotional support and how important that having those types of supports within them are really important. The impact of substance misuse, such as drugs and alcohol, are rampant in our communities, and they recognize this. They point to um, the impact of colonization and the residential schools when they talked about substance misuse. Very amazing kids. Um, the lack of physical safety within their communities they talk to. Um, when you phone the police in some of our communities, sometimes they don't even respond. Sometimes it takes hours. Sometimes these kids don't feel safe just walking down the street within their own communities. Um, lack of activities. If you're not a young boy of a certain age in some of our communities, particularly our northern communities, that like sports, um, like basketball or soccer or volleyball, then there are no activities for you. Our kids love art, they love drama, they love music, they want the same things that every other children and youth want across the world. Um, impact on emotional and mental wellness. Mental wellness and mental health is something that the kids have brought up to us constantly. They lack, we lack resources, we lack accessibility within our northern communities, in particular in Canada, to these supports and these resources. They're calling upon our government to increase supports and accessibility within our communities. Now you'll see these are all the themes that they brought to us. They've identified these, but with each of these, they've also identified solutions. I can't give you all of the solutions, but we are going to be leaving you with uh, a few copies of this that will tell you why and that will give you the solutions. Now, if I can quickly say about uh, Indigenous people being a part of conversations being had about them and being at the decision-making tables, I would say no, that we are not at significant points along the hierarchies that we've created within our country. We have a few people elected, but once you get into our bureaucracy, it's amazing that we have four Indigenous people here representing the country of Canada. Um, we were just talking that five or ten years ago you would not have seen that in Canada. So there, are so there is some progress. But when it comes to Dell and myself at the Canadian Council of Children and Youth Advocates, we're two of the only three in the history of our offices that have ever um, risen to that level within our organizations and within the country of Canada in all the history of our offices. So things like that, we're definitely not at the decision-making tables when decisions are being made about our people and about our children and about our youth. And I think that needs to change. Thank you for your time. Thank you for all the precise information and clarification. Now we give the floor to representative of the state. Thank you. Please. Hmm. Yes, as we know, suicide is 
complex, to say the least. So in terms of data and surveillance, I think we're at early stages of a suicide surveillance and prevention system. Um, there's limited research, limited surveillance capacity to look at suicide prevention. So we're in early days with some of our First Nations and Indigenous partners in developing a suicide surveillance and prevention system. The, in related, related to this subject matter, I think it's important to, for me to reflect upon the work that's been Indigenous-led, Indigenous-driven in the development of our First Nations mental wellness continuum framework to look at mental wellness and well-being in communities, especially for children and youth. At the center and core of that framework, that continuum, is the notions of hope, meaning, purpose, and belonging for the children and youth. Um, without that, in, oct in most of the cases I've experienced, there's some tragic consequences. So we're in early stages of that development. Um, and as our colleagues uh, in civil society acknowledge that there's limited data, but we, we have things to draw on, we need to build that system together. In terms of the second point on violence against women in terms of forced sterilization on sexual reproductive rights impacts, uh, we're in early stages of that development. I know there's class action lawsuits being launched, and uh, as Canada, we will be supporting any documentation and research and information that's required, especially where Canada had a role in terms of some of the administration of uh, hospitals that um, were um, spread across the, uh, the country. In terms of the third point on democratic and uh, public policy formulation, um, <laughs> gone are the days in my humble opinion that Canada or the government of Canada is best to design policies and programs to serve the needs of communities. It must be designed by communities, by Indigenous peoples, or co-developed, if you will, um, in some instances around priorities, uh, strategies, and programs and services that would meet the needs of the population. So at the national level, regional level, from my humble experience, we have co-management tables, joint policy discussions around formulations for strategies to best, need, best meet the needs of the communities. This is all, uh, I think the source of that kind of vision forward is really stemming from the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. It was done many, many years ago. So it's trying to breathe life into those kind of discussions that it makes no sense to develop policies and programs in isolation of the Indigenous populations. They must be at the forefront. They must have voice around the formulation of uh, a vision forward. So we're in early days and I think we've had some successes in the models. I could report that uh, separately in terms of how co-development has led to successful implementation of programs and services meeting the needs of the indigenous populations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. So on behalf of our Inter-American Commission, we'd like to express once again our gratitude to this important public hearing, to the participation of civil society, as well as the chair of the Canadian Pediatric Society, who participated via video, Hada Jeto, um, highlighting the important participation of the state representative and all the efforts and the commitment. And our commission do believe in dialogue, do believe in the transformative power of a constructive and open dialogue. And I'm sure that in one year we'll be back, the same public hearing with efforts, with progress, with change in the situation of the rights of indigenous peoples. So thank you everyone and the session is over.